Colonialism is an important piece here to the understanding of race category, right? According to uh, Smedley and Marx, the European concept of, of race, uh, along with many of the ideas now associated with the term, rose at the time of scientific revolution, which uh, introduced and which introduced and privileged the study of natural kinds and the age of European imperialism and colonization, which established political relations between Europe and peoples with distinct culture and political traditions, All right? Let's skip down to the second, um, I gotta get this logo out of the way here. All right, skip down to the bottom part here. You highlight it, it says the rise of the Atlantic slave trade, which gradually displaced an earlier trade in slaves from throughout the world, created a further incentive to categorize human groups in order to justify the sub this uh, subordination of African slaves, all right? So they, they're they telling you, the understanding colonialism, right? When they colonized the world, they're basically telling you that the reason they had this, uh, the reason they had to create these categories was to ensure that they categorized groups to keep subordination. They wanted to make sure that the slaves remained below them. Right, that was the purpose. That was the all overall goal of creating these categories. All right. So, who is the ultimate father of creating race? Right. It's a guy by the name of Johannin Friedrich Blumenbach. All right. He was a German physician, naturalist, um, uh, sociologist, anthropologist, and pseudo scientist. Right. Interesting fact is that his teachings is comparative and uh, in, in comparative autonomy were applied to his classification of human race, of which he claimed, right? He claimed, remember his story, <laughs> there are five, there were five races, all right? Caucasian, uh, Mongolian, Malayan, Ethiopian, and American, right? So American, according to this gentleman, uh, is a race, right? That's what he thought or believed or whatever his perspectives were, right? And what's interesting was that Blumenbach Pierce considered him to be one of the greatest theorists of his day. And he was a mentor or influencer, influence of many of the next generation of German biologists, including Alexander von Humboldt. That is an interesting character that we're going to talk about now, right? He was also a German uh, polymath geographer, naturalist, explorer, and prominent romantic philosophy, uh, philosophy as science, in science, all right? So what's interesting about this gentleman was that um, there is a lot more details about what he did, but he had the opportunity to travel all throughout the world as a liaison, if you will, to connect with a lot of world leaders and set some standards and some tones. And because of his, because he got the green light to meet with different world leaders, different country leaders during his time, uh, and his influence and understanding of things, he was accepted into uh, what was called the uh, Weimar Classics, uh, whose practitioners established a new humanism for synthesis and the ideas of romanticism, classicism, and the age of enlightenment. All right, age of enlightenment is an important piece to why we. Uh, live in this black ideology, right? Which happened during the 17th and the 18th century, right? This is when they blew up. They were most noticed, noticed and uh, thought about and recorded in history. What's also in interesting is that many scientists and thinkers who contributed to the Enlightenment were Christians, also called Puritans, right? Puritans are the, the first uh, supposed Christians that came to uh, America, when the Atlantic slave trade take pl took place, to colonized this land. Okay. Now we're gonna hit through some more characters. We're gonna again, we're gonna do a little jogging through history. We're not gonna get to, and I know, like, you know, a lot of us might have a little issue with jogging through history because we're so used to the instant stuff. But we gotta get to these. We gotta lay this foundation so we'll know where we're headed. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the Age of Enlightenment. Again, 17th to the 18th centuries, the idea of enlightenment, which emphasizes science and reasoning over faith, 
and superstition strongly influenced the American colonies in the 18th century, right? These were supposed to be the great thinkers of the world. These were the great minds that came together here in uh, the U.S. of A, right? And to be able to bring a different thought to how the world, how people, how everything happens through science and reason, okay? Interestingly enough, the Freemasons were members of a fraternal society that advocated enlightenment principles of inquiry and tolerance. Right, we're gonna look a little bit into the Freemasons, one of the most uh, well knit and throughout the world entities. All right, Freemasons. All right, they teach or they they teaches and practice a fraternal men only order of free and accepting Masons, uh, the world's largest secret society. You know, I knew a gentleman who told me one day, say, you know, we're not a secret society; we're just a society that has secrets. You know, I was like, okay, that's whatever you know people try to spin you with stuff but quite interesting that he said that all right so the biggest thing was that they one of the big things is that they spread by the advancement of the british empire right freemasons i don't you may know some out there you've probably seen this symbol but they started through the british empire and it was during a time that it was well into well before the time that any slave was free per the um you know the Emancipation Proclamation, right? The first Freemason Lodge originated in London coffee houses in the 17th century. Okay, moving on. So, interestingly enough, I'm probably going to say that a lot, but that's okay. Benjamin Franklin, a foremost founder, founding father of America, right? Benjamin, Big Ben on the money, right? He, this, it's history tells us that one prominent member, Benjamin Franklin, stands as a emboldment of the enlightenment in British America. He was at the top of the food chain. He represented the, the, the enlightenment era, and he was also a Freemason, okay? He was part of the, uh, let's see here, he was part of the St. John's Lodge um, in, in 1732. Again, this is before America even signed his Declaration of Independence. And, you know, he was a part of the establishment of this country. And it's so interesting because people always say, oh, this country was founded on Christian people who love the, the Lord and they love the Bible. And, well, you, you know, we're going to look at what, how the Freemasons align, align with the Bible, all right? If you don't already know. Uh, but again, you know, he became a Grand Master in 1734. So two years after. He was involved in the, writing the bylaws or drafting the bylaws. He also became a grand master. So he was part of a lot of the foundation of, of the Freemason organization here in America, as well as established in this country. All right, so let's move on. Prince Hall, free slave. If you know anything about Freemasons, he was the first black Freemason to ever join. And he joined as a free slave, right? He was an American abolitionist and a leader in the free black community in Boston. Having been rejected by the col by colonial American Freemasons, Hall and 14 others sought and were initiated into masonry through Lodge Number 441, the Grand Lodge of Ireland, on March 6, 1775. So it was right at the time the Declaration of Independence was signed, about eight months later, he was in Ireland. Eight months before, excuse me, he was in Ireland. Okay signing away uh, his ability to join a Grand Lodge as a Freemason, okay? Down at the bottom of here, I got Hall and other uh, freedmen founded African Lodge number one, and he was elected master, right? He was the head guy that was elected, right? So moving on, Charles Cordones Poindexter. Right, graduated Ohio State University, went on to Cornell University, where he established the Alpha Phi Alpha Society. This society became Alpha Phi Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity, established on December fourth, nineteen o six. All right, so we jumped ahead a little bit in the timeline here, and, and it says Alpha Phi Alpha is the first black intercollegiate having more than one college chapter fraternity. All right, so they're they're in more than one place, not just at a certain university. 
right? So move along. We're going to get to Charles H. Wesley, right? African American history historian, uh, educator, minister, and author. This gentleman wrote over fifteen books about African American history and political science. He was also known as executive of the Sigma Phi Pi, the Boule, the first of the first of the uh, all black Greek letter organizations, right? The BGLO. So I'm gonna take a little pause here and I want you to ask yourself, why would someone uh, join or be a part of Greek lettering uh, organization has, a, has its roots in Greek when the Messiah was Hebrew, all right? So just keep that in your mind as we move along. What's so interesting also is that uh, Wesley was uh, a Prince Hall Freemason, a sovereign grand inspector, general 33 degree, right? He was at the top or at least close to the top, one of the top. Uh, 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 and let's see here, what else? Of the uh, United Su uh, Supreme Council, Southern Jurisdiction Prince Hall, a member of the Old Fellas, the Elks, and many other fraternal organizations. So this brother was involved in all of it. He was he had his hands and feet in every aspect of organizations that were started by the Europeans. Okay, it says Wesley was an active member of Alpha Phi Alpha the first intercollegiate Greek letter fraternity created by and for African-Americans, right? So we can move on. The Boule, right? The Black Boule Sigma Pi Phi, right? This organization was founded in 1904, right? It's the oldest fraternity for Black Americans, right? This is uh, outside of the uh, Freemasons Lodge, but, you know, there's connections obviously there because they intertwine or you can't you know you join one group you're typically going to be a part of another all right so this fraternity quickly established chapters referred to as member boulets in chicago illinois and then baltimore maryland the founders included two doctors a dentist and a pharmacist right two doctors a dentist and a pharmacist it's interesting because you know we look at revelation it talks about what sorcery is in revelations it says sorcery uh, in Greek, the word sorcery is pharmateca. In English, it's pharmaceuticals, right? And the scripture tells us those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven, right? So, but they joined that organization, right? And these were some um, very prominent gentlemen in the time that they were a part of this establishment. They weren't just any Joe. These guys are very influential in the black communities. All right, so we move along to the divine nine. All right, these are the nine fraternity and sorority organizations that ultimately uh, came out of the Black Boulet. Right, they were established. Um, the first one was the Alpha Alpha, as I said, and these continue to come along along the way. And it tells us here that the National Pan Hellenic Council, the NPHC, is the collaborative umbrella control or council composed of historical. Historically, African American fraternities and sororities, also referred to as the BGLO, right? The Black Greek Letter Organizations, right? The NPHC was founded as a permanent organization May 10th, 1930, on the campus of Howard University in Washington, D.C., and Matthew W. Bullock as the uh, active chairman and B. Uh, Beatrix. Scott, the vice chairman, and um, yeah, so that's where we're at. It's they were established at these organizations. You've probably seen them, they're at every black university or HBC, historically black college, uh, uh college and universities, and um, very instrumental, right? What they do, there's a lot of um, hazing, if you will, a lot of um. You know, people doing things that aren't biblical. They're associating with um, different type of acts that are clearly forbidden in Scripture, and we don't need to get into all that. This is not that kind of uh, training. We're not going to expose the divine nine of the black boule. We're going through a history timeline so that you can see the connections to understand why you call yourself black and how they tie into the age of enlightenment. Okay, the origin of the black church. 
right? This is something that a lot of us don't know how it started. I was, uh, you know, I had a lot of people don't want to hear about the Sabbath day being uh, Saturday and not Sunday because as far back as, you know, great grandma went to church, it was always Sunday. Uh, but the scriptures is clear. And, and when the Most High gave Moses the, uh, the, the instructions for the Sabbath, the day, the time, what they should do, all that was already outlined. But again, we're going to look at some interesting stuff here. So the black church started forming in the 1800s. All right. So the black church, also known as black Christianity or African-American Christianity, is the faith or the body of Christian denominations and congregations in the United States that ministers predominantly that minister predominantly to African-Americans as well as collective traditions and, and members. The term black church also refers to individual congregations, right? I grew up in a black church, so I know what they mean by going to a black church. Also, as I became a minister along the years, I got involved in other denominations, um, and they were predominantly of what the world called white, right? So that was one of the, you know, you knew you was at a white church, a black church, you know. And I'm going to use these terminologies, dude. I, I don't I don't follow the constructs in that in that aspect, but you know, you got to use the terminology because that's relatable to people to understand so they know what I'm talking about. But you know, there's the race and all that, it's a different type of understanding. So uh let's see here. So pre uh predominantly Protestant denominations such as African Methodist Episcopal Church, AME. You all know that, right? The Church of God in Christ, Kojic, and then you got the Nat National Baptist. Uh, convention included, including black Catholic churches, right? So all this started to come out of the 1800s. It was about 15 or so years after America became a uh, uh, quote unquote independent, you know, the Declaration of Independence for the July. We started having this cool black rise of us running our own churches, doing our thing. All right, so we're going to move on here. We're going to look at some interesting facts about how they were actually established, all right? So you got John Wesley in 17th century. He founded the Methodist Episcopal, Episcopal Church, right? That was his organization. And from that, Richard Allen in 1816 formed the African-American Episcopal Church, right? And the purpose was he wanted to create his own. And, you know, there was a segregation. You couldn't do what you want to do. You couldn't have control. There were actually, uh, they didn't even allow for a significant amount of time for uh, ministers to preach or teach or even have even a simple Bible study if you didn't have a, a, a white pastor present, right? They didn't allow that. They, you had to have them oversee the whole program. So he broke off and created his own, said free, uh, right here it says freed slaves. Free slave and accepted, and free slave and accepted and accepted Methodist Episcopal Church. So he was accepted into John Wesley's church. This is how he learned the Methodist ideology, right? Because John Wesley taught him, right? And um, he's named after he he was named. There's a lodge thirty actually named after Richard Allen, right? The guy who started the Methodist organization for Black people. He was they actually named a lodge for him in Massachusetts. Right. Then you get over to Roger Williams in 1715 in the 17th century, founder of the first Baptist church. Right? He was a, he was he's the head dude. He made the Baptist thing happen. And what's you know, uh, some interesting facts we're going to show you here in a second. But out of his church, you had um, William H. McAlpine, McAlpine and about 150 additional black. Baptist pastors. They were tired of the segregation, the racism, the all the different things that came along. So they decided to start their own National Baptist Convention Incorporated. Right. But again, where did they learn Baptist ideology from? The same place uh, from Roger Williams, just as Richard Allen learned the Methodist ideology from John Wesley. Then the Kojic Church of God in Christ, that's established in 1897. And the reason being because there was some uh, group of black folks like uh, Charles Prince Jones and Charles Harrison Mason who got booted out of the church. They got booted out of the Baptist Convention, National Baptist Convention. So they went out and started their own. 
right? There's various reasons they didn't like the doctrine, they couldn't get along, whatever the case may be. So they went out and started their own organization. And you know, First Baptist Church is the largest denomination in the world. Then you got the Kojic, and then you also have Methodists that come behind that. So, but something interesting about this guy here named Roger Williams, uh, you know, people love their Baptist stuff. They love their Baptist church. They love their denomination, you know, and they're hardcore to the T about it. They'll fight the Calvinists, the John Calvin folks, and they'll fight all other kind of stuff. But the truth is, Roger Williams was a very interesting character based on Lodge, what was written in um, about him in Lodge 32, Freemason Lodge, right? Uh, they were actually trying to figure out how to name the Lodge. And they said it was, they argued, however, that that Roger Williams possessed the traits of character and vow and views of human duty towards God and man quite in accord with the general principles of Freemasonry, right? It was then decided that the name of Roger Williams should be adopted as the designation of the lodge. So why would they, why would the lodge, if there was a dis clear distinction between uh, Roger Williams and his faith as a Baptist and the actions of Freemason, which are not the same, right? People like to try to connect the two. They're not. When, I, when, I, when, you, when I'm talking about biblical truths, not so much denomination, but biblical truths, they are complete distinct uh, ways between the two, okay? So you're not going to name somebody after your organization that is known for um, it's secrecy and it's eliteness and how it's been involved in the world for a long time who doesn't agree with what you believe, right? It just makes basic sense. You don't even need to have no spiritual deep understanding of that. All right, so we're going to move on a little bit. What do the Baptist church think about, right? The Southern Baptist Convention, what do they think about Freemasonry? You know, I've talked to Baptists before. They go, oh, no, there's no way we're going to accept something like that. But here's what they told them in 1992. This is, the, this is the recommendation they gave about Freemasonry, right? It says, in light of the fact of many tenets and teachings of Freemasonry are not compatible with Christianity and the Southern Baptist doctrine, while others are compatible with Christianity and Southern Baptist doctrine, we therefore recommend that, consist, recommend that consistent with our denomination's deep convictions regarding the priesthood of the believer and the autonomy of the church, members in the Masonic order, right? Be a matter of personal membership, excuse me, membership in the Masonic order be a matter of personal conscience, right? Highlighted here in yellow. So interesting. Let me blow this up here. It says, therefore, we exhort Southern Baptists to prayerfully and carefully evaluate Freemasonry in light of the Lordship of Christ, the teachings of the scriptures, and the findings of this report as led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I think that's quite interesting that they said, you guys basically pray about it. Right? Just pray about what you think the, um, the Freemason, joining the Freemason or being part of it as a member of the Baptist church. But what does the Bible say? <laughs> what does the scripture say? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11 says, Have no fellowship with the fruitful, with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. There's a lot of dark stuff the Freemasons do. All right. There's a lot. Period. All this good that I, I've I've met a few. I've, you know, there's I've been these different lodges and stuff. They I've been invited to these organizations. People have told me some things that are part of them. They show me their rings and all this good stuff. And I can tell you it doesn't align with the word. Right? What's secretive? Why do you need to keep the gospel if it's if that's what they do? If they're truly about righteousness, why do you need to keep it so secret from society? That's just a dead giveaway right there, right? But instead of actually uh, casting down the lies and telling their members not to live according to such ways, they tell them to basically pray about it, right? And let the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, lead you. That's not sound teaching. <laughs> the Apostle Paul said, if anybody brings another doctrine to you, uh, that person is cursed. Let that person be cursed. If they preach another gospel, he said, if me or even an angel preach another gospel, he said, forget about that person. All right, walk away from them. Don't even entertain that. All right? So 
we're going to look at the Freemason tree of influence, right? How are they involved in churches, the world, right? I put together a little diagram here, and it shouldn't be uh, too challenging to look at, but, you know, it can be a little bit. Let me get this logo off of here. It's like trying to chase a fly. All right, so first and foremost is I, I put in here that the Enlightenment group consisted of ministers, reverends, Puritans, Christians, physicians, naturalists, uh, physiologists, anthropologists, theorists, so scholars, anthropologists, or, or um, philanthropists, and pseudoscientists, all right? This is what the Enlightenment group consists of. So you had your Christians or Puritans a part of this group. So long before there was a First Baptist church, long before there was a Methodist organization or any church in, in itself as a, an organization in America, you already had this Enlightenment group of people called Puritans and Christians. So before the country was erected, right? The Freemasons and the Enlightenment group share the same views and practices. They worked in the same type of mindset. They were all connected, right? The Freemasons were part of the pre were presidents and politicians. They were involved in establishing the country from day one. We saw that with Benjamin Franklin, right? Freemasons created uh, or led to the creation of pre Prince Hall Freemasonry in 1706. And from the Hall, Masons, the, the Prince Hall Freemasons, they recruited from the black church. The reason why you know this is because you didn't get into Prince Hall Freemason unless you were black. And you hadn't already established universities and colleges like that for black people. So the only place to recruit them from were the organizations that they gathered in, where they talked and communicated, made plans, fellowship, whatever the case may be. That's where their recruitment started, right? And then you get the boule, the black boule, Sigma Pi Phi, started in May uh May 15, 1904, they recruited not only from the black church, but they were part of the establishment of the, establishment of the divine nine fraternities and sororities, and they recruited from them. You basically can't be a black boule unless you come out one of these organizations, these fraternities or sororities, right? That was intentional so that you can come through the education, the doctrine, the training that is suitable for their organization. You just can't walk in there some Joe off the street. You had to already be conditioned to do, to live according to how they operate. So if you look at it, there is a, there is a, a, a net that the Freemasons had complete, complete involvement in and established in the ideology of black churches, you had black sorority groups, you had the black uh, Prince Hall Freemason, the black boule, right? But it all came from the Enlightenment group. Right, these were all people. Either they were Freemason or Enlightenment, and this spilled over into the establishment of what we call these black organizations that a lot of us um, have heard of, or maybe even are a part of. 